Good morning. Welcome to your Urban Affairs Committee. Today is January 31st, 2023. I am T Senator Terrell McKinney. I represent District 11, and I am the Chairman of the Urban Affairs Committee. Before we start, I would ask each Senator to introduce themselves, starting at my right. John Lowe, District 37, uh, Gibbon, Shelton, and Carney. Hi everyone, I'm Megan Hunt and I represent District 8 in the northern part of Midtown Omaha. Good morning, Senator Carol Blood representing District 3, which is Western Bellevue and Southeastern Papillion, Nebraska. The committee legal counsel is to my right, Elsa Knight, and the committee clerk to my left is Raquel Dean. Today and before all hearings, all bills to be heard will be posted outside the hearing room. The center introducing the pr proposed legislation will be, will be first present to present. Senators who serve on the committee are encouraged to ask questions for clarification. That said, the presenter and those testifying are not allowed to directly to question senators serving on the committee. For purpose of accuracy to record, we ask each presenter to state one's name, spell it, and state who you represent, if not yourself. If you're planning to testify today, please fill out the testifier sheets that are on, that are on the table at the back of the room. Be sure to print clearly and fill it out completely. When it is your turn, come forward to testify. Give the testifier sheet to the page or the committee clerk. If you do not wish to testify but, will, but would like to indicate your position on the bill, please complete the sign-in sheets on the back table. The sheet will be included as an exhibit in the official record. In your Urban Affairs Committee, we will use the light system to promote, to promote maximum engagement of those wishing to express their position or proposed legislation before us. The light system will generally be five minutes with the green light and one minute with the yellow light, with the red where you'll be asked to conclude. We, we will recognize opponents, proponents, and neutral testifiers today. We also acknowledge letters received from all concerned parties. Should you have handouts you wish to share, please share 10 copies or ask the clerk to make copies. The clerk will then distribute any handouts to all committee senators. Following all proponents, opponents, and neutral testimony, the bill's presenter is offered the opportunity to close with final remarks. As a committee, we will work diligently to give a fair and full hearing. We will make every effort to accommodate special requests of assistance. At this hearing, we ask that you be respectful of the process to one another and please silence or turn off your cell phones. Senator Wang, you can begin. Good afternoon. You're starting this off on the right one already today. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Chairman McKinney and members of the Urban Affairs Committee. My name is Justin Wayne, J-U-S-T-I-N-W-A-Y-N-E, and I represent Legislative District 13, which is North Omaha and Northeast Douglas County. Prior to 1981, the city was elected at a at large basis. I do know where this started. Um, uh, all seven members of the city were elected on a citywide ballot. As a result, there was nobody from North Omaha, particularly no African Americans were, were elected. And of course, this was by design, uh, and actually it was Senator Chambers in 79 that changed this with LB 33329 that requires cities of the metropolitan class uh, to be passed by city council districts. Prior to that though, uh, villages, first class cities, primary class, all of them are in statute, have uh, membership uh, sizes that are in state statute. And even then, this was in state statute prior to 1979. We just, uh, the body changed it to allow for districts to make sure we had fair representation. Once that fair representation uh, was a part, Fred County was the first person to be elected to city council. I introduced LB21 not to change the makeup of the city council, but to make sure that there, there's proportionate representation. Current city council's districts range anywhere from 57,000 to 77,000. Even in district, even if the districts are, are heavily populated, the average city council size is around 64, which is nearly double many of our legislative districts. The purpose of this is by adding two seats would hopefully reduce this to around 45 to 55,000 making it more likelihood that they can know their uh, city council person and have contact with their city council person. Uh, in the past, uh, the city of Omaha has had soft opposition. Some city council members wanted it. Some city councils didn't want it. Uh, and at the time, they were waiting to go through their uh, home charter changes. From the whole charter changes, it still hasn't made any recommendations to change this. So I, I try to keep bringing this bill to keep it in the forefront that Maybe we as a state should continue to look at the city size uh, and as far as the district size to make sure that they can have 
uh, representation that kind of matches what we do here, which is around 40 to 45,000 people per legislative district. It is always been mindful for us to of how people are representing the city of Omaha, particularly because the city of Omaha is our largest city. Uh, and so there's no other reason behind this bill is just to make sure this body continues to look at representation, not just from the villages and first class, but also from from the city of Omaha. I'd, I would be open to up to nine and leave it to the city council to decide. I know with some of the smaller municipalities, we have a four or six um, and even a or three or five. And that way we allow them to have the flexibility. We can allow the same thing for the city council to decide. I do think the timing is right now uh, this year. In case this was the past and we allow the city to do it, it allows them to go through the process of designing and going through that process of designing their legislative or city council districts, getting feedback from the public and be ready before the 2025 elections. With that, I'll answer any questions. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Hunt. Senator Wayne, how many times have you introduced this? Is this the second? I think it's the third, but okay. I think third. Um, what can you remind us what the main reason is? Main reason for the for for thinking it should be seven, nine instead of seven. Well, it's. I don't know why it was initially nine. It was a long time. I mean, seven, it was a long time ago. I just know in the seventies, we try to, we broke it up from the at large to dis council districts to make sure they had fair representation. I just think nine is because it, it reduces the overall population of the city council <laughs> districts to around 50 to 55,000, which is more kind of what we deal with uh, as legislative districts. And we know how hard it is to, to stay in contact with our constituents. I can't imagine having a city council district of, 75,000 people. So is the reason to. to kind of, like you think it would be better representation for those constituents? Correct. Not being spread so thin, basically. Correct. Thanks. Yeah. Well, and some of the count, some of them just don't make sense. So my city councilman is Pete Festerson, mm -hmm. who represents me and you. Which is And like we have completely the, different, the, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> completely different <Okay>. districts. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Senator Love. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman and uh, Senator Wayne. Um, I am ignorant uh, to, uh, is the city council paid in uh, metropolitan, metropolitan class? Yes. Um, how much are they paid? Uh, you know? The last one I remember was 36, but I think it's going up. Um, I can get you that information. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? I have one, uh, Senator Wayne. Another thing I was thinking about as you were testifying, as you were opening, have you considered moving city elections to even number years? Absolutely. Um, somebody else brought that bill last year. Uh, in my uh, haste to get bill drafting, uh, not so many bills this year, I did not bring that. But I, I am all in favor of that. I know people think it gets lost in the uh, national. Um, but I think the opposite happens in the city of Omaha is we come off of a national election and people are burnt out and don't want to turn around four months later and do a, a city election. So I think it actually is a detriment to voter engagement and, and people because they just went through a national election and, and five months later are supposed to vote in their local. Right. So I would, I would be very open to that amendment. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. I, I'm second in education, so I have to wave closing. But if there's any questions, uh, I'll be more than happy to help. And this is a, definitely a, a consent calendar uh, item. So <laughs> have a good day. Are there any proponents? I guess just one. Good morning. Uh, my name is Wes Dodge. I'm from Omaha, and I'm associated with uh, Represent Us. Can Omaha. you uh, spell your name? Oh, I'm sorry. W-E-S, and then Dodge like the car, D-O-D-G-E. Thank you. Um, I'm associated with Represent Us Omaha and Rank the Boat, Nebraska. 
and I'm here to speak as a proponent of this bill. Um, I think it's a good bill, um, and I think it's a good bill because it allows better representation. I, I liked the two questions we've already heard from the committee. Um, I looked up some numbers, and, and I trust Senator Wayne's numbers better than mine because he has better resources than I do, I hope. Um, but I looked up the population of the city of Omaha when we had um, uh, the first council that I could find, and there was 366,000 people. So each, if you divide that out, each council person would represent about 52,000. In 2023, the population of Omaha was 860,000 from the sources I could find. Now, this is where my numbers are different than Wayne's. It seems like the numbers should be a lot higher, so I don't know what number they're using, but I, I had it at, you know, over 80 or 90,000 per representative. So there's something I don't understand there, but even if it's like 60,000, I still think it's a, a good uh, a good bill. Um, so even, uh, I looked up the populations of the city in Nebraska and the number of people represented by a council member at the city of Omaha is still about the equivalent of like the third or fourth largest city in the whole state of Nebraska. So I think as far as expanding it, you get better representation, each person's vote and representation has more strength if we do expand it. Um, now, Senator uh, McKinney, you ask a great question. Um, I attended the, the city council's uh, charter convention this summer. Uh, I didn't get to be an acting member of it, but I attended it. And uh, the mayor actually came up and said, we should um, have our elections on the same schedule as our primaries and our general. Um, in the campaign process that I've seen for mayor, they said our, our uh, elections cost about a half a million dollars each election. If we're paying our, our council members $36,000, we pay for that by, by putting those in the same in the same calendar. I think we can do that by extending uh, uh, a, uh, a term by two years for half of them and do an odd even rotation like we do in the legislature, save a lot of money. And then, of course, with my, my bias towards ranked choice voting, <laughs> I would like to see the state adopt that or, as well, similar to 793 that was offered last session. And that would uh, allow us to potentially cut out the primary again, saving another half million dollars. And then Right now in the whole United States, there's over 13 million people represented in ranked choice voting situations. Um, people who use it like it, the acrimony goes down in the elections uh, and it makes it difficult for uh, the parties to take as much control as they can because you have multiple people from the same parties running. So it's a more effective method, it saves money. So I would like uh, the committee to look at those changes. I think it's a good bill as it stands, but it could be better. All right. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you. All right. Thanks for having me. Are there any other proponents? Any opponents? Anybody here to testify in the neutral? No, with that, we'll end our hearing on LB21. Thank you. We may have to wait a little bit to, for uh, Senator Linehan.
있습니다. 
the next project is not coming along as quickly as we thought and we're told. And I have concerns whether we'll ever get a billion dollars from the federal government. In addition, even if the next project comes on, it doesn't pay property taxes because it's the university hospital and they don't pay property taxes. I also question whether I don't think the new science museum by the river is going to pay property taxes. So I don't know how those help create property taxes. Um, I'm sorry. Too many hearings in there. Um, somewhere, and I will find it. It also talks about this was this I stumbled over because somebody told me something, but it is on the website. The current route takes the streetcar over Interstate 480 on Farnham and Harney. Discussions are underway with the Nebraska Department of Transportation, that would be state agency, to share the cost of modifying the bridges for the streetcar. So I don't know how much that's going to cost. I don't know what those conversations are, but it seems to me that if the state's going to be helping pay for the streetcar by building new bridges over the interstate, that we might be more included in the conversation. Finally, I went back and looked at, I have not read this before, but this is the agreement that created the interlocal agreement between the city of Omaha and the transit authority of the city of Omaha. So two things I noticed in this that I thought were concerning. The city and Metro intended that the project shall com complement rather than compete with, compete with the Metro system. The city and Metro will coordinate to ensure that project is not competing with Metro for any federal or state funding or otherwise burdening Metro, Metro's current and future taxing authorities. So I'm not a lawyer, but I read this and I think that's one reason the city never went after any federal funding because the agreement says they're not gonna go after federal funding. Then finally, and maybe most concerning, I'm not a fan of interlocal agreements anyway, but page three of 12 of the agreement, to the fullest, uh, section three, to the fullest extent permitted by law, no member shall be deemed to have any fiduciary duty, any duty of loyalty or similar duty or obligation to the streetcar authority, which supersedes any such duty a member may owe to such a member's appointing board. None of the people on this board are elected. I think that's problematic. So, thank you. No problem. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions from the committee? No, uh, I have one. Oh. It's kind of rhetorical, but I, I think it's good to ask. Is it fair? Well. Do you do you think the city of Omaha is using TIF as the statutes intended? No, I don't. I don't actually. I'm not a lawyer, and I don't know if they don't use it. I don't. I suppose a citizen could sue. I I like the idea of a streetcar. I love Midtown. I love downtown. I just building something that's over three somewhere between three and four hundred million dollars, all on the hope that we're going to have increased value. Well, it's not even just increased buildings, like new buildings, but as you all know, the number one issue, and maybe living in Elkhorn, it's different. Number one issue, but even in North Omaha, we have people who are trying to hold on to the house because of property taxes in this state. They're way too high. And the way I read this is that whole corridor, which is a lot of, medium income housing, those valuations are going to go up. And part of that's going to be used to pay for the streetcar. And that's real money to real households who have to decide whether they're going to pay the property taxes or feed their kids. Besides property taxes, do you think anything else will be increased? Well, there is, I have two other bills 
that I don't know where they, I think they go to government. Uh, MUD has concerns about who's going to pay for all the new infrastructure under the roads that have to be dug up. So that could mean, and hopefully the city and MUD will work this out, but it could mean an increase in water fees. And as you well know, we already have very high fee, sewer fee on water bills, and it's not related to the cost of your, your income or related to your valuation in your house. It's $50 for every household in Omaha. They have to pay that every month. That's $300 a year. It's already too high. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any proponents? Any opponents? Good morning, Chairman McKinney and members of the Urban Affairs Committee. My name is Steve Jensen, S-T-E-V-E-J-E-N-S-E-N. -E 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 I'm a former planning director for the city of Omaha and currently serve as a deputy chief of staff for economic development for Omaha Mayor Gene Stother. I'm here today to speak in opposition to LB 389 as drafted for three main reasons. First, it would prevent the ability to use TIF for a new project on property that may have once received an approval for TIF, but that for some reason never moved forward. Second, it would prevent the use of TIF to assist additional development on a large site, such as the Gallup campus in Omaha, where because of a change of plans, a company has vacant land that now it plans to make available for a different development project. Finally, 389 would prevent the use of TIF for any project in Omaha's urban core for the next 50 years, following the creation last year of the urban core housing and mobility redevelopment plan TIF district that covers much of the area from the Missouri River to 48th Street uh, and from Cumming to Leavenworth. The bill would stop the development of roughly $400 million in projects that are currently in the planning stages and another $5 billion in projects that past history and numerous market studies project will happen over the next 30 years. Projects that according to the Chamber's Urban Core Strategic Plan will help fund the modern streetcar, encourage the use of Metro Transit's bus and BRT systems, fund bikeways, attract and retain a talented workforce, bring 30,000 much needed jobs back to an area that has lost tens of thousands of jobs, save hundreds of dollars a month in car expenses, and bring tens of thousands of new apartments and affordable housing units to Omaha's downtown and midtown areas. I would add that Omaha completely agrees that TIF should not be used merely for the purpose of revitalizing a building that has previously used TIF. The city was approached by someone, if the city was approached by someone who purchased a hotel, for example, that had been built 15 years earlier uh, using TIF, and they were wanting to rebrand the hotel and refresh the rooms and public spaces, the city of Omaha would say no. If a developer purchased an apartment complex that had been built using TIF, and the, new, the previous owner had depreciated the building, allowed it to run down, and the new owner wanted to do repairs and remodel the rooms using TIF, the city would say no. This has always been and will continue to be the position of the city of Omaha on such TIF requests. In closing, I would reiterate that Omaha does not support the use of TIF merely for the purpose of updating buildings that had previously used TIF. We do, however, strongly oppose the bill as drafted since it would stop the implementation of the city and chamber, chamber of commerce's plans for the revitalization of Omaha's urban core and stop the effort to attract 30,000 jobs and 30,000 residents to the core over the next 30 years. A plan that would result in the development of roughly $6 billion in new development, create an attractive and unique urban lifestyle, save residents thousands of dollars a year in transportation expenses, increase affordable housing and catapult Omaha's urban core into the top tier of major cities in the country. I appreciate the opportunity to speak in opposition to this proposed legislation 
I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. I also have uh, others here from the city of Omaha uh, who might be able to answer questions as well. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the committee? I have a few. Uh, do you think the city of Omaha is using TIF uh, in the way that the statute is intended? I do. I think that uh, we're very careful uh, in the analysis of projects that come in. We look to make sure that the project couldn't happen uh, except for the TIF. Uh, one of the things I think that is important to um, understand is that uh, developers have to make money or they wouldn't do a project. So there is some money that developers will make from a project using TIF, um, and that's necessary. Otherwise, they would invest their money somewhere else. And so I think we're very careful. We analyze every project. We make sure that the um, things that they're going to spend the TIF revenue uh, to do are uh, eligible TIF expenses. We make sure that the project is a good project and that it needs the TIF in order to move forward. So specifically, the definition of blighted requires that we consider the economic reality of, of individuals living in those areas, unemployment, poverty level, safety, housing, and, biz, and, and buildings. But in some TIF reports in 2017, there was 1,600 units built, but only 150 low income. In 2018, 716 units, only 48 low income. 2019, 17, 1,713 units, but only 120 low income. 2020, 1,928 units, only 96 low income. My concern is that we're decreasing affordable housing in, in, the, in the illusion of we're increasing affordable housing. Yeah, and I think that, you know, that's a concern for the city as well. And so the city is currently working with uh, other entities, nonprofits in the area, the Front Porch Organization, for example, to try to find ways to increase affordable housing. One of the great things about this uh, project is that we're not just looking at the streetcar. We're looking at all aspects of improving the urban core. But one of the key components to that is affordable housing. Um, so part of the TIF that we will be receiving um, over the next uh, 15 plus years uh, will go toward affordable housing in the core. So not all of the TIF revenue that's coming in will be used for the streetcar. It'll be used for bikeways. It'll be used for other uh, transit improvements. But uh, second to the streetcar uh, is the affordable housing component. And we're looking for ways to be able to do that um, earlier rather than later. Senator Hunt. Thank you, Chairman McKinney. But is there an affordable housing requirement for TIF? Well, it's one of the things that we're looking at right now. There isn't a requirement. Um, and so one of the th a couple of things I would mention is that, you know, it, it costs uh, anywhere from four to five hundred dollars a month minimum just to own a car. One of the things that will allow that people will be able to do in the curb and the core because of the uh, streetcar is to be able to move around without a car. So by the time that we see the streetcar constructed, people will be able to not only use buses to move around, but will be also be able to use uh, uh, the streetcar to move around. The combination. So, so the, the hope for the streetcar is that low income people who can't afford a car will use the streetcar for transportation. It's just one of the one of the benefits. What I'm saying is that is, the expectation it, given given that we have a bus system, of course, that's really underutilized. Right, so it's a combination of the two things. One of the things that we have done is we've lost uh, um, anywhere from 17 to 20,000 jobs in the urban core uh, over the last uh, 50 years. And so one of the key problems that we have is now we devote uh, almost 60% of the downtown area to parking. We've reached peak parking. Right. So bringing jobs back to downtown, these are jobs that are best accessed using transit. It's the most transit heavy portion of the city. So when we take jobs out of that area to the tune of tens of thousands of jobs, then jobs are less accessible uh, using transit. And so then people have to own a car and four to $500 a month, um, $6,000 a year in order to own a car, um, if you can then live without a car, because now you can access all of the things that you need uh, without a car, then yes, it makes it makes uh, housing more affordable immediately. But in addition to that, 
part of what we will do with the revenue that comes from the TIF is we will use that revenue to help uh, um, encourage the developers to build more affordable housing. And we are looking at plans on how to make that work right now. So it's a combination of the two things. So my thought, listening to what you've said, is there's a difference between what I want and envision for a beautiful city. And then when we build that, how it's actually used or like what the outcomes actually are for people. So I just don't understand how we can say that something like this would provide affordable housing because Benson, the, the district I represent, the neighborhood I represent is completely blighted. Like it's all blighted by definition and statute. And the housing, as you know, Senator McKinney was saying when he was asking you questions, the housing that's been built under TIF is not affordable. Um, so if TIF can only be used in blighted neighborhoods, um, who, what, what mechanisms are we using to provide housing for the people who are displaced by these condos? I mean, I don't own a home. I'm a renter in my district. And the condos and things that are getting built with this TIF money cost way more than anything I can afford to say nothing about like a three or $400 car payment, which I think is extremely high. Like I think most of the people who you want to reach with this pro project don't make that kind of money at all. And when we talk about the jobs, this will create jobs for who, you know, what jobs, who's qualified for these jobs and are they the people who can't afford a $300 car payment? Are they the people who are going to be ostensibly relying on the streetcar? Um, I think, it's going to be beautiful. If we get the streetcar, it's going to look so pretty. It'll be nice for the workers at Mutual of Omaha to go get their salad or something. But like the idea that this is going to lift up low wage workers, that it's going to provide affordable housing is probably not realistic. And I think we should probably just not say that. I think we should talk about what the vision is and not, and just be clear that that's a vision, not maybe realistic. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I have another. Um, is it appropriate to use TIF to displace people who need that community development the most? I would say that the that it it is part of what happens when a new project um, is built. You you may see some displacement. I think again that is why part of this plan and to Senator Hunt's uh, point, part of this plan is trying to find a way to reverse that so that we have additional revenue that can be used to pay for affordable housing units so that we don't have just displacement and replacement of that um, uh, lower cost housing with higher cost housing. So I think it is the combination of these things that together we will be able to uh, sort of uh, move in the right direction and be able to ensure that we'll get more affordable housing units. And so right now, like I said, that that work is underway and we're looking for ways to do that. In fact, we have a project that we will probably put a, a request for proposals out for a piece of land that the city owns. And one of the things we're looking at is that as a part of that would be a requirement for affordable housing. So it is part of what is in the plan. Uh, one thing I wanted to correct, too, is when we talk about the, the, the four to five hundred dollars a month in, uh, for an automobile, that's not the payment for the automobile. That's a piece of it. But it's also the maintenance, the insurance, the upkeep and so forth. And so the average cost of owning a car is is actually far higher than that. Um, but when it comes right down to it, when you combine all of the aspects of owning a car, uh, it's expensive. So the more we can do to provide jobs uh, for uh, all of those districts that can access those jobs in downtown using uh, uh, public transit, um, the, the more affordable all of the housing in the area becomes. Um, Transit-oriented development was sold as a tool to increase affordable housing, but to date, there are zero units built and zero affordable. So is the streetcar for economic development or is is a streetcar an economic development project or infrastructure project? Well, it's an infrastructure project that creates economic development. And so uh, just as a, a, in an SID, um, it, there's infrastructure that is built using the SID mechanism and it creates economic development. So this is no different than that, um, no different than putting in a sewer line or, or utilities. Um, they all help our, our infrastructure improvements that help 
generate economic development. One of the key things I think in this case is that, again, as I said, we've essentially traded jobs for housing, uh, or for, I'm sorry, jobs for parking in downtown over the last 50 or 60 years. And so when you devote as much as 60% of your downtown to parking, there's just no place for those jobs to go. And so losing tens of thousands of jobs in the core Jobs that can be easily accessed from Benson, from North Omaha, from the other areas that are well served by transit. What that means then is you, if you live in those neighborhoods, you must own a car in order to get to work because it's not easily accessible by transit. The urban core is, and that, that is very helpful. I got two more questions. The first is, why was the old market deemed extremely blighted? It's the old market. And I've, I've always had trouble really understanding that. So why did that happen? You know, I, I wasn't there. And so perhaps it would be a question for um, Jennifer Taylor, who uh, was with the city at that time. Um, so I can't tell you exactly how all of the decis decisions were made on what areas were extremely designated as extremely blighted. And my, my last question, and I'll stop. Um, you talk about using a streetcar as a way to get individuals that can afford car payments and those type of things and getting them to jobs, things like that. And I'm thinking, I'm sitting here thinking, then why don't we send a streetcar from the poorest, poorest areas of Omaha, if that's the mission? Yeah, so I think, you know, certainly that is the future. The, the problem is how do you pay to extend the streetcar to begin with? And so um, what we're doing in this case is we're taking advantage of the fact that in this urban core area, we have very large buildings and very... Uh, and, I, and I think that's the problem that I think the city is going to have to deal with. The individuals that need those type of amenities in a city feel like the city prioritizes corporate entities over poor people. And poor people in Omaha, the regular citizens of Omaha, largely, I would bet, would more more than likely want a streetcar to go through those areas instead of helping out big, develop, big developers and corporations. Yeah, and I, I think it, when you look at extending outside of that core area, um, what needs to happen then is you need federal funding and you need a match for that federal funding. So it takes longer and it's more expensive because of the federal funding. So in order to really initiate the system, what has worked across the country is to begin with a core system and the facilities and vehicle maintenance facility and so forth that support that core system. And once that is in place, then you also have the ability to extend off of that system. So much like you see in Kansas you, City and other but cities. But you do understand why people feel the way they feel because the it's, it's not it's the reality is it's a prior you're prioritizing big development and corporations over common people in the city and they're looking at this and they feel like their voices are not being heard even when they show up to city council and things like that so, yeah so I, I hear what you're saying I think and I I think it is a, um, an understandable reaction to it I I, I get how feel people feel that way again, in order to create the system to begin with, when you look at federal funding, it just takes a long time and it needs a great deal of federal funding plus a lo local match. So part of what this allows us to do is to develop more of the property in downtown to provide those jobs and then to provide revenue that can be used uh, to match those federal funds so that we can extend. One thing I wanna make sure I mention is that the uh, Streetcar Authority has directed its staff and directed HDR to begin the process of looking at extensions. That work is underway. I think I shared with you uh, last week a, 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 a map that shows the extensions that are, are being looked at today. And so there are extensions that would then go north and south and, and so forth and, and provide that transit. So part of the development and part of the revenue that you get from the urban core area can then be used to help match those the federal dollars to make those extensions happen. So the this I, urban core area helps to pay for that. And we can finish here. I think what the city needs to understand is you're asking people who historically have been left out to continue to hope and wait. There's no guarantee for federal funding 
there's no guarantee that the streetcar will ever go through those areas. And you're asking people who have been left out of a lot of things for pretty much their whole lives. And you're asking them to keep hoping and waiting. And that's the issue that a lot of individuals in Omaha are, are have a problem with, with, with this project. I guess the, the only thing I would say is that if the streetcar in this urban core area is not built, then there would not be the bump in value that is created by the streetcar. And it is that bump that we are using to pay for the streetcar. So if we do not build this streetcar, it does not make it any easier to build a north-south line. In fact, it probably makes it harder and because we don't have the revenue that would come from the initial bump in valuation that's created by this streetcar. So I, all I can say is if this streetcar doesn't happen, we can certainly apply for federal funds, but we have to find the match and there wouldn't be any uh, match that would come from this urban core area because the, what happens, it, the funding that is used to build the streetcar is generated by the bump in value that is created by the streetcar. So no streetcar, no value, bump, no additional revenue, no additional revenue, no money to be used for affordable housing, to be used for um, further extensions of the streetcar. Um, that, that, that money doesn't happen. All right, thank you. Uh, Senator Hunt. Thank you, Chairman McKinney. <clears throat> what I have to say isn't a question for you, um, but because everything we say in this committee is transcribed for the record, and we haven't had the opportunity to say anything on the record um, in the floor as a full body, uh, I want everybody to know that there's a very, very important political rally happening right now in the rotunda for Senator Geist who is the chairwoman of the transportation committee. So she left her committee to go to her political rally in the Capitol. So if any of you would like to leave your committee responsibilities to go join the political rally in the Capitol, I wanted to let you all know that was going on. Thank you. Senator Blood. Thank you, Chairman McKinney. And thank you for sharing that, Senator Hunt. Um, so we, we we're talking a lot about TIF. And you know, I was previously on the city council, so I probably have a different view of TIF than some of the people, the other people that sit on this committee. Um, mine has been a more positive experience. Um, and I'm always concerned about bills that are seeking out like one particular project in one particular city as to whether that's good policy or not. And so I'm kind of on the fence right now about the, this particular bill. So the, the questions that I need answered um, we're talking about zoning incentives when we talk about TIF, correct? Okay. So where are we at on like, I, I, and I do read Omaha's report when it comes to affordable housing, by the way. So I actually feel like you guys have definitely made inroads, um, maybe not fast enough for some, but for as big a community as you are, I'm actually quite impressed with some of the movement forward. So where are we at? Are we offering, um, I'm going to use acronyms because it's going to be faster. Um, WRNs, ADUs, TODs, PURs, inclusionary density bonuses. Are we utilizing those other tools in this area as well? We, um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, transit-oriented development, we have a corridor that um, uh, is in place. It covers part of this area that we're looking at um, that encourages uh, higher densities, which also helps to lower costs. Uh, we have that. Um, in terms of PUR, that's a um, planned unit residential that is part of Omaha's code. So that is in there. That also helps to uh, increase density and allow it, uh, enable someone to put more units on a, a piece of land. Um, in terms of with, AD. With the goal being when we do that is for what? I'm sorry, what? I want to make sure we get this on record. So what is the goal when we do that, when we're able to add more units? Well, by adding more units to an area, first of all, by ha being able to have more units on a, on a parcel of land, you just get um, uh, a lower cost to the development of that land, and therefore the units are, are less expensive uh, than they would be if you were putting fewer units on a piece of land and then having to pay all of the additional costs that go with that. Um, and, so, and then with accessory dwelling units, I know that that has been uh, worked on and, and proposed by the city. Uh, I, I can't tell you right now, and I don't know if Jennifer could, but I can't tell you where that sits right now. But it is it is something that the city of Omaha has drafted, and I don't know if it has moved forward. And so, so would I be accurate in saying that um, there are other zoning in, in, um, incentives outside of TIF 
that actually lean towards making things more affordable when it comes to housing, um, not only in this area, but in, that's like kind of a zoning thing now in Omaha, correct? Correct, and uh, exactly. The, the transit-oriented development overlay extends along the entire route of the uh, uh, BRT of Orbit and uh, would extend along other uh, routes as well, so okay. yes. I appreciate that. Sorry for all the acronyms. I just thought it would be faster, so. Sure. Thank you. All right, are there any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. Are there any other opponents? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, good morning. Uh, my name is Scott Dobby, S-C-O-T-T-D-O-B-B-E. Uh, I appreciated Mr. Jensen's testimony and all the questions we've heard from the committee uh, and look forward to uh, maybe broadening uh, some of this to a, a statewide level a little bit as much as um, we do focus uh, in Omaha. Um, so my background, I'm the executive director of Omaha by Design. Uh, for more than two decades, Omaha by Design has served as the region's nonprofit hub for people-centered urban design and policy. Uh, we work as a trusted liaison between the public and private sector, and we seek to enhance uh, our fellow residents' quality of life through uh, well-planned uh, cities and spaces. Uh, you know, for a picture of what that means, I think equitable access to parks uh, and public amenities, vibrant neighborhoods, and the transportation options to safely and conveniently move about. Of course, each of these also carries an economic dimension. And as we seek to encourage growth uh, in ways that make our metro more resilient, uh, more competitive, more, more sustainable. And in all that, we, we really have remained steadfast supporters of TIF uh, as the concept, because we've seen time and again, uh, it's unique capacity to simultaneously enhance that quality of life, as well as spur economic development. We find this in looking at the community I know best. I actually hail from Kearney, born and raised myself, but have been in Omaha for a little bit now. And um, as we look at the greater Omaha metro, which, by the way, we see is stretching from you know, Council Bluffs to Elkhorn and Florence to Bellevue. And uh, as as we do that, we, we really come to see uh, and to know TIF as an essential tool in furthering the revitalization in urban areas throughout. Uh, crucially too, TIF enables investment to occur in and near our city's areas of highest need, better connecting residents to opportunities for employment, uh, to education, and to the cultural and civic amenities that are part of this great democratic value that a, that a great city provides. You know, and that's certainly the case as we consider Omaha's urban core, which despite being just about three square miles in size, is headquarters to all four of Nebraska's Fortune 500 companies. You know, that makes it both an economic engine and a focal point for economic mobility. And, you know, as you well know, whether we're talking the big ones like Union Pacific or the hundreds of small and mid-sized businesses that call our city home, all are really engaged in a competition right now with our neighboring states to draw and retain and develop the workforce that we need. You know, utilizing TIF to unlock district level infrastructure enhancements helps to catalyze that sort of walkable and transit connected talent attracting environment that ultimately strengthens our city services, our local schools and our neighborhoods. So it's clear that, you know, for the sake of our fellow citizens and for the health of our state cities and the balanced economy that they help to provide, we need the opportunity that TIF and TIF districts can offer. Given all this, we respectfully oppose this bill on the following grounds. One, that it would discourage uh, investment in urban areas, decreasing the number of new jobs and slowing the creation of affordable housing where both are needed most. And two, it would put unnecessary roadblocks in the way of locally significant projects, whether you're talking Omaha Streetcar or uh, at the city of Ponca where they did new downtown streets and sewers with the same mechanism. So in closing, as we've seen uh, across the state from Norfolk to Kimball and Auburn to Scotts Bluff, TIF districts have and continue to be a valuable tool in the economic development toolkit um, for the development and maintenance of urban areas. Preserving this, uh, this capability in our city's toolbox is vital to the continued health and revitalization of core neighborhoods, 
ultimately delivering both an enhanced quality of life and a great return on an investment to the citizens of this state. So I thank you for your time and would welcome any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Kavanaugh. Thank you, Chairman uh, McKinney, and thank you for being here. here. Is it Dobby? Dobby. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Dobby, so I was not able to be here earlier, so forgive me if I'm redundant to some of the previous questions, but uh, my reading of this bill is it just, it wouldn't eliminate TIF, it would just prevent TIF from being used more than once in 50 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for a lot of the projects you're talking about, I mean, most of those, I mean, how many projects get TIFed multiple times in 50 years? I wouldn't know a number. Uh, I wouldn't say it's it's a lot. Um, I think uh, you may be getting at the question of where would that happen? Yeah. And some of the instances are you may have a situation where a, a, a property has has taken out TIF. Uh, the Gallup property is one like that. But then, you know, development plans didn't come to pass. There's still a large parcel there. Um, situations such as that. I don't think it would be granted, you know, in any way willy nilly uh, for non-significant enhancements, but when there's only a great enhancement in the value is, is how I understand it. But of course, I'm, I'm not the city. So just to kind of back up there, you said a few things. So one of them was about unused TIF, where TIF's granted is unused. I would imagine that, I, I mean, I don't want to speak for Senator Linehan, but that sounds like a, a tweak to this bill that wouldn't necessarily undermine the intention of the bill. I don't think the intent, and again, don't want to speak for Senator Linehan, but it seems to me the intention is that we don't double dip as opposed to saying, well, we started somewhere and then we stopped. I mean, so would your that alleviate your concerns if we put in a caveat that said the TIF has to actually be utilized? I follow. Um, I, I think that I would really kind of defer to, you know, perhaps those who are most in the weeds day to day of actually how, you know, TIF is granted or applied for and such. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest that from our perspective, we're looking, you know, broadly from the overall like viability, vibrancy, developing that kind of character of a neighborhood in an urban design sense. So we see TIF as a as a critical tool in that. We want to make sure that it is uh, flexible to be used in the ways that best benefit the city and its um, its inhabitants, obviously. And so for TIF, and this is, again, I'm new to this committee, mm -hmm. missed the earlier part of this hearing, but my understanding of TIF is that it's meant to facilitate projects that otherwise wouldn't happen. And it is in a blighted area because we're trying to essentially raise up for out of blight, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is if we're granting TIF to a project and you're saying it's a successful tool to do all these things, if it is successful, why would it, the same property require TIF in quick succession? Well, you know, quick succession, 50, uh, 50 years, I would suggest, you know, is a long time and it's, it's hard to exactly ascertain all that could come to pass in 50 years. Uh, but certainly it's not, uh, it's a significant move. It's an important tool. We've seen it advance our cities because of its use. And I think our perspective, again, I, you'd be better served, um, I, probably by answers for maybe somebody who understands it in the greatest depth of how these deals are structured together. But we're looking at that broad level about what we see these enabling happening inside our, our urban core and the, the vibrancy that they can help to enthuse. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I have a couple. Sure. Um, so you mentioned you're from Omaha by Design mm -hmm. and you've been doing it for two decades to improve Omaha. North Omaha has gotten worse in the last two decades. So what is your plan and for North Omaha to address that issue? Well, uh, our organization has been in operation, yes, for, for two decades, as I said, and thank you. Um, you know, myself, I've been in this role four years. I'm an architect by training, and my passion is, is this city and this city at large. Uh, and we certainly have a heightened focus. Um, though we are regional and though we look kind of with that broad brush, we certainly put uh, added emphasis in the areas of our city that have been disinvested for years and where uh, we have structural conditions which have uh, pr prevented uh, growth and development in the ways that would most benefit their local residents. And so thinking of the North Omaha community specifically, you know, it's been our um, great honor to, to work alongside a lot of neighborhood partners in the development of, uh, you know, the North Omaha Trail. Um, our partners at 75 North and, and us have uh, led the development of uh, affordable housing prototypes, which are open source and open to all. 
um, have just been published. It's called the Affordable by Design Housing Playbook. And the idea there is small single family infill designs that can be replicated that are really high quality, um, but provide affordable options. Uh, you know, we also have been showcasing some of the best, which all our neighborhoods hold uh, in an annual event that we kicked off last year called Open Omaha. So I didn't mean to make this about us in any way, but I just wanted to say I share your your passion and your concern and your interest uh, to invest in the places that right now need it most. But you you see the difference that when you talk about Midtown, you talk about jobs and economic development. When you talk about North Omaha, you talk about a trail and affordable housing and a community event. Do you see the contrast there? Uh, I see how it all comes together, honestly. Um, I think there's uh, there's a need for all that. We're trying to build these holistic, uh, you know, comprehensive communities. And so it's it's both and. Uh, we need the housing, we need the connectivity, we need the uh, infusion of, of jobs. And I think that where we can best accommodate that is in our core and north and south Omaha. There's this contingency there where things are easy to get to or can be easy to get to once again. And anything we can do to further that growth and to heighten the possibility and the likelihood of that growth continuing but you see why the people of North Omaha feel like the city of Omaha doesn't care about them. And, I, and this is my last question. So do, is it your opinion that the city of Omaha is using TIP in a way that the statute's intended? I do think so. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Any other opponents? Good morning, Senator McKinney and members of the Urban Affairs Committee. My name is Christy Abraham, C-H-R-I-S-T-Y, A-B-R-A-H-A-M. I'm here representing the League of Nebraska Municipalities. And I certainly appreciate the previous testifiers focusing on Omaha. I just wanted to give a little bit more statewide perspective on how this bill may impact others out there. Certainly Lincoln and Omaha are impacted, but I did reach out to several other municipalities just to get their take on this. Um, and there seems to be concern from smaller municipalities as well. A lot of your smaller municipalities are really focused on their downtown area. And that has been a project that takes many times decades to get their downtowns um, where they want them to be. Um, so you have had downtowns that maybe have been declared substandard and blighted for over 50 years and they're working on them. Um, one example I heard in particular was there was a, a manufacturing plant that moved into a municipality sort of on the promise of the use of TIF. And that was over 40 years ago. And that manufacturing plant, they've moved out and it's fallen sort of into disrepair. And that community <clears throat> expressed, it's like, well, we would love to have someone move into that place and, um, and, and rehabilitate it and make it better. But with the 50 year prohibition, they may not be able to do that for another 15 or 10 years. And I apologize, I know all of you on this committee are very smart. I just wanna say again, I know that TIF is a complicated issue. And uh, many of you I'm sure are sitting there thinking, well, why would you have to re-TIF something? Um, because the purpose of TIF, as you know, is to take something that's substandard and blighted and to make it into something that's better, that's new, that's rehabilitated, that's, that's an improvement to the community. And we certainly appreciate Senator Linehan's intent on that. And I don't know of any municipality where after a 15 year TIF project, they are re-TIFing again. Uh, I, don't, I don't know of that happening. And I certainly appreciate that you don't want that situation to happen. The league is obviously very open to working with this committee and Senator Linehan if it's possible to come up with um, language to allow a city to create its own policy to say, you know, we're going to wait a certain amount of years before we retiff a property. 50 feels a little bit too long for us. Um, there's also the question about the definition of what is a parcel. Sometimes a parcel is a fairly large area. And maybe part of that parcel has been redeveloped. Something has been put on that, but there are other 
places that are vacant or not developed. And under this bill, I'm not sure that that other part of that parcel would be able to be redeveloped. So these are just some of the concerns that um, municipalities from across the state have expressed. And I just wanted to let you know that this is more than just an Omaha situation. And I'm happy to answer any questions anybody might have. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Cavanaugh. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for being here. Sure. Sam. So, I mean, what it sounds like what I'm hearing you is that 50 years is too much, but some other number might be workable. Senator Cavanaugh, I'm always open to, to working with this committee to make, make this bill better. That's something the committee would like to work on. We're, we're always going to advocate at the League for having as much flexibility in TIF as we can for municipalities because every municipality is different. Um, certainly, probably our first preference would be language that allows the municipality to create the policy uh, to allow them to determine how many years might be reasonable. You might have a community that says, yeah, we wouldn't reach if anything in 50 years, but you might have another community that says, well, maybe we would reach if after 10 or 15 years. So we just would like as much flexibility as possible. Okay. Um, and... I guess currently, so, you know, you know, the, I'm new to this committee. So under TIF currently, can you, could you can re-TIF within 50 years. Can you re-TIF a property that is currently under TIF? I don't believe so. Okay. Um, because you, you want that, you know, and bond council scare me. So I'm, I'm just going to say, typically when you have a TIF project and you're paying off those bonds, they want that property you know, to be on that project and that repayment schedule with what's currently there, not adding an additional, oh, we're going to do an, another project on top of that. That doesn't typically happen. But it could under the statute? I don't think it could. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you. Any other questions from the committee? I got one. What if this bill was limited to cities of the primary and metropolitan class? Would it change your opposition? Senator McKinney, thank you for that question. Uh, Lincoln and Omaha are part of our league community, and if they are opposed, we would continue to be um, opposed to it as well. All right. But thank, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. No problem. Are there any other opponents? Anybody here to speak in the neutral? Senator Linehan? I think, <clears throat> thank all the testifiers for being here. I appreciate many of their comments, but I do have some pushback. The city of Omaha tipped the casino. The only place the casino could go is at the horse track. There's no but for it. It was going to happen. There were no proponents because we're the proponents on this, in my estimation. I'm saying we need to be careful about how we're using this because it affects taxpayers. And if we have too much parking in Omaha, which I've heard several times, why are we building another parking garage for mutual? 2,200 spots and buying three garages at Midtown, the city is. Federal funding takes a long time. We'll get started. Like, I would be, as the chairman said, much more excited about this project if it ran north and south, which I think two decades ago it talked about going from the airport to the zoo. It makes a lot of sense. There is no, as, as lucky as we are in Nebraska and specifically Omaha about having donors to projects, whether it's University Hospital or the new Science Museum or all of the new $400 million park downtown. There's no, there's no donors that I know up to this, which concerns me. If it's a great idea, where is the philanthropic community backing this up? The main question I have, I'm going to go back to it, and I think everything I've heard this morning confirms it. They're going to use valuation increases to pay for TIF, not building a building, 
creating something new that wasn't there before, but increases on people who live there now. They have said that they're not going to do individual residencies. I don't know that that, I don't know how you do that constitutionally, separate with how you're treating residential property from commercial property. I thought you couldn't, but I'm not a lawyer. Regarding your question, Senator Kavanaugh, on retiffing things, they just said there, I don't know how long Gallup has been on TIF. It's back before we went to 20 years, probably 15 years. I don't know if they're talking about it's coming off, so they're gonna have to retiff it. At what point have you tiffed enough that it's no longer blighted? Anything that I see there doesn't look blighted to me, it's beautiful. The situation is our property taxes are so high that developers are saying we can't afford to build things without TIF. It's become like an inverse to tax people so much that we have to give them back the taxes to build the building. And 50 years, the reason I picked 50, and I maybe there's another number, but this really needs scrubbing because now TIF can go for 20 years, right? That was the bill that we passed a couple of years ago. It can go out for 20 years. So basically they're saying we're going to re-TIF the same properties every 20. The whole Midtown was TIF when Mutual built out. And it's beautiful. It's great. It struggled, though. I mean, there's new restaurants aren't lasting there. There's something wrong with that plan. So now we're going to re-TIF it. I just think it really needs a lot more scrutiny than it has had, and that's why I brought the bill. Thank you. Are there any other que any questions from the committee? Um, I'm trying to think of how one. Oh, you're thinking the last one. Senator minute. Kavanaugh. You, thank you, Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just so used to calling you Chair. <laughs> Senator Linehan uh, for bringing this bill. It is interesting to think about. Um, you answered one of my questions about the the time frame. But what about the other one about the dividing parcels? Um, I don't have a problem with dividing parcels if it is a situation which you have some of this in this TIF district. Which, so you've got, you got all of Midtown that was redeveloped by Mutual, which is that center part that overlooks the park. That clearly, I would have concerns if we re -tiff that. But then if you just go down the street a little bit, there are clearly some buildings that are not useful. So if there is a way to figure out that, like how you can separate those parcels, I don't know enough about your committee or how you would do that, but I understand. And that, that was mentioned to me in meetings that if you say a parcel, some of those parcels could be huge and some of them could be tiny. So maybe there's more to be done there. But you're willing to work to make Absolutely. accommodation if we find a way that would work. Absolutely. Thank you. What? <laughs> What is your response to city officials saying that they need to develop the streetcar project and the whole project period to do the other things in other areas in the city? I find it uh, I mean, I think I know where you're coming from, Chairman. It seems very odd to me that we're developing a streetcar for people to, maybe it's for jobs, but a lot of it seems to be so you can play, which plays fine. I mean, it's great. And I understand I've lived in big, I haven't so much as my kids have lived in big city, DC, for instance, and you can get her, nobody has a car because you have Uber, you have Lyft, you have the Metro system. That's great, but it's federal dollars. It's a big plan. It includes the whole community. It includes people actually who can't afford to have a car to get to work. I think that's a big deal. I don't see this plan. I think maybe the answer is show us the big plan and how you're going to get there versus just this east west route. Yeah. All right. Are there any other questions? Seeing none. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, um, we'll close our hearings for this morning. We'll be back at 1.30 p.m. Thank you. Oh, uh, and we had two proponents, three opponents, and non-neutral, for the record.